fill in the blank, you're not getting any younger. So the most of your time. Um, I really do believe that time is precious and time is plentiful. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast, a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week, I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people, just like you, who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? Hey, any youngers, Jen Glantz here, back with another brand new episode. Here's the thing. If you listen to this episode on the day it is officially released, you're listening to it on my birthday, April Fool's Day. I was born on the 1st of April, which is probably one of the most difficult birthdays to have because for so long in your life, people try to trick you. So those birthdays you have as a kid that are supposed to be all fun and games become nightmares. People played the worst pranks on me growing up. I used to dread my birthday, my least favorite prank. And if you do this, please just just don't. Are those trick candles that people put on birthday cakes that when you go to blow them out, they just never blow out. And I'm somebody who loves cake. So if you're messing with me having to go through the process of officially eating my own birthday cake because I can't blow out candles, I'm going to be officially mad. And I've gotten that prank so many times. This year for my birthday, I'm excited to release this awesome, awesome episode. It's all about time management and priorities, which honestly is something that I struggle with so incredibly much. The number one thing that's currently stressing me out is my calendar. If you looked at it, I might even just like put screenshots up in the show notes. It is insane. There are some days, actually a lot of days, where I am working from, I am booked to work from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. at night practically straight. I have like a 10-minute break every couple of hours. And it's just crazy because I think one thing people don't realize is that people who are entrepreneurs, even those of you who work full-time jobs but you have kids or you have side hustles or you have hobbies, is that we spend so many hours trying to make all of our commitments work that it burns us out and we don't have time to do the things we actually love or the things that are going to actually lead to things we love. I'm going to introduce this week's guest coming up soon, but one of the things that she talks about is something called a list of 100 dreams. And I can't stop thinking about this list because a lot of us, we make bucket lists or we make New Year's resolutions and they're great and sometimes they last and sometimes they don't. But if you had the challenge of writing an entire list of a hundred dreams that you wanted to accomplish, what would be on that list? And how quickly would you get it done? So my calendar is stressing me out. I told you about that. And I get so many emails from people who want to meet, who want to do all these things. And they want to invite me to these events, which are so great. And I want to get coffee with everyone who emails me. But I don't even have time to go to the bathroom for the next couple of months. That's how crazy my schedule is. And it's stressing me out. It's making me exhausted. I'm currently drinking a coffee that I feel like has the power of water because it's not even working. (laughs) But I think the thing with priorities is I'm making a huge mistake in the next three months burning myself out with work that I made a promise to myself that in July, I'm not adding anything new to my calendar. No interviews, no coffees with people, no workshops, no events, no nothing. I'm taking that month to do exactly what I already have on my calendar, which is probably close to 80 hours a week of work, and I'm not adding anything else. And then from there to the rest of the year, I'm going to get extremely picky about what I add because I think we can only make the same mistakes only a couple times before we just get burned out. And I want to make my 100 dreams come true fast because it's my birthday. And that's my wish to myself is to get going on what I care about and not what everybody in my inbox wants me to care about. 
Today's guest is Laura Vander Kam. She is the best-selling author of What Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast and Off the Clock, among others. Her new book is called Juliet's School of Possibilities, and her 2016 TED Talk, How to Gain Control of Your Free Time, has been viewed more than 5 million times. She also has a brand new podcast up on iTunes called Before Breakfast that I highly recommend you check it out. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode, and as always, my friends, if you could leave us a review in iTunes, that would mean the world to me. Consider that my birthday present. Why do I keep pushing this? Because it helps the show spread to the ears of strangers all around the world. It gives the show credibility, and it helps me create more awesome episodes and book more amazing guests, just like this week's guest, Laura. Plus, come hang out with us in the Secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group. There are so many amazingly awesome people people in that group. It is total best friend goals. Hope to see you there. My first question for you might be a tough one, but how would you describe what you do to somebody that you just met? I would say that I write books and speak about the topic of time management and productivity. Um, I'm always trying to help people feel less busy and get more done. Which I think in 2019 is even more of a prominent topic to talk about. Recently, you came out with a book called Juliet's School of Possibilities, a story about the power of priorities. I have to tell you, Laura, I was reading this book and I was literally just nodding my head the entire time. The main character in the book, Riley, she lives inside of her inbox. All she wants to do is is push toward her work, get a raise, get a promotion, stay afloat. And I could not even believe how much I saw myself inside of her character. Talk to us about what it is about 2019 where we're all just so attached to social media, to our inbox, to sort of the wrong things. Yeah, so Riley is a very ambitious young consultant, but uh, her life is falling apart on various dimensions. I mean, she's working really hard at work, which would be great if it was making her successful, but unfortunately it isn't. Um, she is sort of just constantly in her inbox answering whatever is in right in front of her and not thinking about what the most important things are for her to be doing. And, you know, that probably got her a certain way, um, you know, but now that she's in management, you can't just do everything. And so she has to think about what's the most important thing to do and she can't. Um, so her company is basically given her an ultimatum 30 days or she's out. Uh, in the meantime, her personal life is falling apart too. Her boyfriend and friends losing patience. And in the midst of all this, she, you know, finds herself going to, a retreat at this place called Juliet's School of Possibilities. And she doesn't want to go because she thinks it's a waste of time. But while she's there, she learns a lot from this mentor figure, Juliet, about how to, you know, spend your time well and wisely as opposed to just uh, being busy all the time. I, I loved it so much because as somebody like myself, who's an entrepreneur, a freelancer, I, I do my own thing. I set my own schedule. I've lost so many relationships in my life because I'd be out with friends. I remember early on, I'd be out at, on a Friday night with friends. And while everyone was having fun laughing, I would be having, I would be looking at my phone, checking my emails, and then taking out that anger and frustration on my friends. And I lost so many people too, just like Riley. So even as I was reading the book, the book was fascinating. It was such a great Thing to read, but I will be honest with you, Laura. I checked my email about mm, 25 times while reading the book, and the book is very short. So, how in the world do we break this addiction of of checking our email constantly, of of waking up and the first thing we do is going on Instagram, of looking at a to do list that never ends but isn't really important to us? What can we do to break for the through from this? Yeah, it's funny you use the word addiction because one of the signs of that is when you get a you know trigger to look at it. And I think the fact that I mentioned her inbox in the book is probably what then made you say, oh, I should check my email. Um, you know, at one point, Riley talks about the numbers on her unread messages rising like the numbers on a seconds on a stopwatch. And people said they've read that and it's made them incredibly anxious. I'm sure it's sent a number of people into their own inboxes <laughs> to check that things aren't rising that quickly. Um, you know, I think... People sometimes ask me about hacks to like spend less time on email, and I think that entirely misses the point because email is a tool to do our job just as various other things, maybe social media, Slack messages, calls, whatever it is. These are all tools to do our jobs. They are not our jobs themselves. 
and they tend to expand fill the available space. So the only way to spend less time in your inbox is to choose to spend less time in your inbox. And I think one of the sort of philosophical things that that helps people you know recognize this is that the reason people are emailing you is that they think you have awesome ideas. But if you are constantly in your inbox going back and forth with people and checking everything, you don't have the space to come up with the ideas that makes you the sort of person that people want to email in the first place. Um, so, you know, there's, there's various smart scheduling strategies. I just interviewed somebody who mentioned that she responds to emails in two one hour long blocks during the day, early in the day to answer all the stuff that comes in from Europe and Asia later in the day to respond to the stuff that comes in from the Americas. Um, and will only glance at it and deal with absolutely urgent stuff, um, outside of that, which I think is smart. You know, if you can get yourself down to spending you know, two hours a day on email instead of feeling like you're spending all 10 hours of your work day on your email, well, that opens up a lot of time to, to do creative things, to do long term strategic thinking, to invest in relationships at work, all these things that tend to get crowded out. I think one of the things that I loved the most is Riley has this big awakening, this big epiphany that she has to sort of reprioritize her life and do what's important to her. There's a quote in the book I loved. It's, I have to see the vision of life I want to have. I have to ask of every minute, of every decision, of every obligation that I choose to take on, is this bringing me closer to that vision or am I just doing it because it's there? That was something that gave me a little bit of anxiety because I feel like, and like most people too, we're just keeping up with the motions. We're doing what we can to pay the bills, to make sure that we're just keeping up. But truly, we're not really even focusing on the things that matter. What kind of advice can you give to people so that they can take a couple of steps back and figure out what those obligations are that matter to them in the long run? Well, I think one of the things you know, Juliet says in the quote is, you know, this vision of the life she wants. And she has Riley see two possible outcomes of her own life, too. I mean, one is if she just keeps reacting to whatever is in front of us, doing whatever is there. Um, the other is if she makes strategic choices about how to spend her time consciously investing time in the things that are most important to her. So I encourage people to create a vision of yourself in the future. You might picture yourself at a dinner being given in your honor a few years from now and people are giving toasts to you. Like, what are they saying? What are they toasting that you have done that's been so, you know, created such impact for the world and for your relationships with them? And, and think about those things. And then you can start asking yourself, well, what steps can I take in the more near future to get me to that? I mean, you know, if people are, toasting you because of the books you've written that changed their life. Well, you need to start writing those books. So maybe you need to figure some time in the next week where you can brainstorm ideas and maybe write outlines of chapters you do. But you know, what happens is when we get so busy, we think, well, I'll do that later. Or, you know, that's not important right now. I'll get to that. That's a nice thing to do, but not, you know, terribly important. These other things, these emails right in front of me are important. And that's the route where you never actually get anything that matters done. Do you feel like some people are scared to admit what they really want? Like, I think one of my defense mechanisms is that I'm, I fear so many things that instead of pursuing what I really want, instead I'm going to do all this BS stuff instead. Like, do you find that that's common with some people? I think it is. And it is based on uh, reality, which does, nobody can know the future. Um, and, you know, particularly if you think about it, I mean, maybe your dream job or you've had huge impact is in an industry that doesn't even exist right now, right? I mean, this is things change quickly and it's hard to know. And you may, you know, picture yourself like I have a happy family, but who knows like what size that'll be, who your spouse will be. I mean, these are all things people may not know when they're starting out in their life. Um, and, and so because the future is unknowable, that can tell us to sort of say, oh, well, why bother, right? Why even think of this? But just because you can't know exact things doesn't mean you can't come up with a image of you being happy and fulfilled and doing wonderful things. And even even if the exact means of getting there is not something you actively anticipate, it, it's still a larger goal you can see. I mean, I think about this with my life. I've always thought, well, I want to write books. You know, that was something I knew I wanted to do. But that's ultimately about spreading, you know, my ideas with you know, and sharing them with as big an audience as possible. And so as I've been thinking about that, well, podcasting has become bigger in the in the past few years. And I've realized that you know, the options exist there for sharing my words with big numbers of people. Um, and, and so one of my new projects, I have a, a podcast that is called Before Breakfast. It's these short productivity tips that are scripts I've written 
so it is sharing words with a big audience. Now, I wouldn't have anticipated doing that, you know, 10 years ago because it wasn't as big a thing then. Um, but this helps guide us like, is this a good choice or is this not a good choice with my time based on the larger image? I think what you said is so great, too, because the podcast before breakfast, there's short little digestible tips for people in the morning. It's so completely on brand with who you are and what you've done. It's almost like an extension of what you're already doing. So one of the things I wanted to mention is in your other book, 168 Hours, you have more time than you think. There's a challenge you have in there called 100 Dreams, where people can list a completely unedited list of anything that they want to do or have more in life. What is the purpose of that challenge and what can a challenge like that do for people who might be so unclear about what they actually want in life? Yes, yeah, so this was an exercise that was shared with me by a career coach named Caroline Sinisa Levine many years ago when I was writing 168 Hours. And the idea is people will say, oh, you know, I have no time and so I don't need to think about what I'm going to do with my time. And what winds up happening with that is open time appears and they do whatever is easiest because they haven't thought about how they want to spend their time. So this list actually gives you ideas of what you would like to do with your time. So getting to 100 is pretty hard. I will say that. Um, you know, the first third might be easy because a lot of people want to travel more. So it's like the 33 countries they think they want to visit. After that, it starts getting a little bit more complicated. It'll be things like, oh, well, there's that state park that's an hour from here that we've you know, lived here six years and have yet to visit. Or maybe I want to take a pottery class or um, I'd like to actually have some of my photos up on the wall or, um, you know, I think it would be fun to read more poetry or write more poetry or whatever it is you want to do. Right. But you have to actually really think about this um, and you'll have to revisit the list several times to get yourself all the way to 100. But then when you have this list, you can start putting some of these things into your schedule. So, you know, if you've got some open time on the weekend, you could just sit around and look at Twitter or you'd be like, hey, Remember that state park? <laughs> like, why don't we get in the car and go there? Because it's a beautiful day. And you'll have all sorts of wonderful experiences while you do that and actually, you know, have some memorable time that, that then makes time feel richer and, and more full. And it also teaches you what it's like to do stuff that you like to do, what it feels like to have good, meaningful things in your time. And it's a very, uh, you know, that's a good addiction. Maybe email is the bad one, but uh, having fun stuff in your life uh, really whets your appetite for more. Amen to that. And this is my goal to do this list before I turn 31, which is happening in a couple of weeks. And I think I'm going to link to your list in the podcast, but I love your list because it's broken up into sections and there's things about travel, but then there's things about personal and professional. And some of the things on the list are gigantic. They're huge, but others are simple and some were just so beautiful. My favorite on your list, Laura, was number 96, which was to become a regular somewhere at a restaurant or coffee shop. Has that happened yet? <laughs> It has not. Uh, and, and, you know, people say, well, you're the time management expert. You should have done all these things on your list immediately. No, um, it, it's a work in progress. Some things have crossed off my list. And, you know, sometimes you decide things aren't the right thing to pursue either. I mean, one of my favorite stories about this is Caroline, the woman who gave me the exercise uh, years ago, she had made her own list and, and she'd put on the list she wanted to learn to sew and she wanted to take like sewing classes because she'd been telling herself for years like, oh, I have no time to sew. You know, I never, I'm, I'm so put upon, so busy, I have no time to sew. So then at some point she's like, okay, I'm going to do it. So she takes a sewing class, like hates it, hates it. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, realizes I've been putting mental energy into, you know, telling myself this story of, oh, I have no time to do this. I don't actually even care about this. Um, so it's off the list. Like, isn't that good to know? Um, but, you know, I think that there are some restaurants that I do like, and I've gone to many times. Sadly, one of the ones in our neighborhood that I was really becoming a regular at closed. <laughs> we can't, uh, you know, control the larger world, alas. And my my eating there was not enough to make the restaurant want to stay open. Um, I have another restaurant downtown in Philly that we go to relatively frequently, and I've probably been there four or five times a year. So I don't know if that makes me a regular or not, but maybe I'm getting there, right? Uh, I, I'll probably find a place around here as well. I'm gonna. Now that you've mentioned it, I'm gonna I'm gonna do better on the lunch front uh, around here. 
I just loved that one for some reason. I don't know. I mean, there's there's other great ones on yours, like getting a good headshot that you love, which I know you did. And then there's another one that's like buying a speaking dress that you feel awesome in, which I know you did as well. And I love that you're so transparent about all of that progress. And as someone who is as quote unquote busy as you, I think it just goes to show that we really do need to eyeball exactly what we want and go after it. A quote in the Juliet book is, I don't have time can also come off meaning it's not a priority. And I love that because my dad used to joke that he wanted to get me a hat that says, I don't have time because that was my favorite slogan. So I want to talk about when people say, I don't have time, what are they truly saying when they say that phrase? Yeah. So this was, I mean, one of my favorite interviews of all time of a lady, a lady pretty much told me this. I mean, she was doing an amazing amount of things in her life and You know, what she said is rather than say, I don't have time to do X, Y, or Z, she'd say, I don't do X, Y, or Z because it's not a priority. And if you think about it, that is more accurate language. People will tell you they don't have time to floss, which is ridiculous. Like, they don't want to floss. Like, let's just own that truth. Like, they don't want to floss. And you can blame time, but it isn't about time. It's that we are choosing what we wish to spend our time doing. And now there may be, may be very good reasons that something is not a priority at any given point. I'm not saying that about flossing. I'm pretty sure that people could make time to floss if they would like to floss. Um, but, you know, maybe if you are a new parent, for instance, running a marathon, probably not a huge priority for you right now. Um, maybe if you're in an extremely busy time at work, uh, starting that side hustle may not be a big priority for you right now. That's not saying it won't be in the future. That's not saying it won't be, um, it wouldn't be a priority for somebody else. Like, it's not saying it's not an important thing. It's just saying that for you right now, this is not a priority. Uh, And if that's true, I think we should just own that truth. Like, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, If you find yourself saying that, you realize, well, that's actually not true. That is a priority for me. Well, then I would challenge people to make time for it within your life. Absolutely. And I think that that's such a good realization to have. I highlighted like that line in the book over and over and over again, because it's something that I want to stop saying, especially if I don't mean it. We have a couple of questions for you from some of the members of the You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group. The first question is from Megan. She's been told and she's tried endlessly to become a morning person to become more productive at that hour. But she's so groggy and she still finds herself the most productive right before bed. Do you have advice for her? Should she challenge herself to be more of a morning person or should she just stick to being productive in the late hours of the night? Well, if you are a night owl, um, there is nothing you can do to change that. Uh, So we kind of need to respect the chronotype. Um, So if if she knows that about herself, awesome. You just need to build your life to take advantage of that fact. Um, Often this is hard for people because, you know, jobs start early. Uh, Your boss wants you to be in an 8 a.m. meeting. The fact that you're a night owl isn't necessarily going to (laughs) fly as a reason for why you're not showing up. Um, Or, you know, people who are night owls still have children who have different chronotypes and the baby's up at 6 a.m. Like you've got to deal with that. Right. And and so this it makes it difficult for life when you are a night owl. Um, But if you can solve for those challenges, um, then then by all means, use your evening and make sure that you are uh, taking advantage of that time that you're not, you know, just hitting next in the Netflix queue, that you are actually doing productive work. Now, I think a lot of people, when they say that they're groggy in the morning, they say, I'm not a morning person. What they actually mean is they're tired in the morning, but that's because of when they went to bed the night before. Um, and it's not that they are night owls, because if you look at what they're doing at night, it's not creative, productive, awesome work. It is hitting next in the Netflix queue. Um, and so if that is you, Uh, You might want to cut that puttering off a little bit earlier, go to bed a little bit earlier, and then you can get up earlier while still getting enough sleep and turn unproductive evening hours into productive morning hours. So if you are writing the great American novel at night, by all means, continue doing so. Don't let anything I say stop you. Um, If that is not what you are doing at night, then you might want to try to shift your schedule around to make sure that you are getting enough sleep, um, but going to bed early enough that you can get up on time. I, I, I tend to think that going to bed early is how grown ups sleep in. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I think adjusting our sleep schedule as we get older is so important because we got away with a lot in college. We got away with even more in high school. But then when we become adults, we have to really look at how we're sleeping, when we're sleeping, and also our productivity. So I love that advice. Another question from our mutual friend, Molly. She sent, what is the most unexpected time management hack that you have ever heard from a reader or a listener? 
Hmm. Hmm. Well, you know, I've, I've kind of heard it all at this point. Um, but I mean, I think that the one it's, it's not unexpected, but I think it sent my, uh, time management in such an, a productive direction is this idea of using mornings. And I remember many years ago, a, a lady I was doing a, a time makeover for, I mean, she worked as a, a lawyer who lawyers have to, you know, build, build time. And, and so there's always this question of like working long hours. And she was feeling like she wasn't spending enough time with her two year old because she couldn't really control what time she got out of work. And so often she'd get home. Uh, as her daughter needed to go to bed or or even after her daughter's bedtime. So she was feeling sort of sad about this. Um, but I looked at her time log and I saw that she was getting up with her kid in the morning. Um, and in fact, they often had like two hours in the morning before she left for work. It's just, she wasn't seeing that as time they had together. And so I said, well, you know, given that this time is there, let's just change the story that the time I spend with my kid is not after work at the normal time, it's in the morning. And we're going to do whatever we would have done in the afternoon. We're going to do it in the morning together, you know, play together, go outside together, like you know, whatever you're going to do, read stories together in the morning. And it just, you know, it, it changes the whole mindset that you don't have to do things at the normal time. Um, it may be that you're even doing things. You're just, you know, not noticing them either because they're not happening at the normal time. Um, and, and so when you take a really broad look at where the time is going, you can often get around these you know, harsh trade-offs that, that people have talked themselves into. I love that advice. And I have a personal question. This is one for me where when I was reading the book, I st was stuck on this page for so long. And the question is really around priorities, but also making money, especially when you are an entrepreneur, a freelancer, you are responsible for what you bring in every single month. So how do you separate, okay, this is a job opportunity that's going to give me money, but it's not leading toward my ultimate goal. Or let me pursue an opportunity that's not going to bring me as much money right now, but it's on the path that I should be taking. How do you differentiate which one you should go toward, especially when you do work for yourself? Well, I don't actually think that these are either or. Um, one of the strategies I've talked about with a lot of, of freelancers, I, at one point I had this whole huge metaphor of like mastodons and, you know, fish and, and fruit and berries, because we're kind of the hunting, hunter gatherers when you're, when you're self-employed. Um, you know, you always want to be chasing the mastodon, like the big thing that is ultimately what you want to be doing. And it's hard and it's speculative. Like you, you don't bring down that many mastodons in your life. Um, but, but they're really awesome when you do. With that, you also need to have a fairly good diet of, of the fish and the, the roots and berries. Um, but you don't want to spend all your time on those things, right? So maybe you can consciously set up your work so that you're spending two to three hours per day on the stuff you know is bringing in income, or maybe you feel better doing it by the week. Um, so for instance, I tend to think of my weeks as like, you know, I spend one to two days on speeches that involves traveling to them, giving them. Um, and, and that's, you know, a good way to make a living. Is every speech amazing? Well, so most are really cool. And I love meeting the people. Um, but you know, a speech I'm giving to a corporation They've hired me once that, you know, they might hire me for a different group in the, in the company, but it, it doesn't have the broad sort of marketing outreach that like speaking to a big conference with lots of people would, you know, so it's, it's more of the, the fish and the roots and the berries than the mastodon, like giving a Ted talk. Um, but you don't get to give many Ted talks. So it's, I, I guess, you know, structure your life. So you spend some time on the things that, you know, will bring in the income for sure. And then make sure that you do give yourself a fair amount of time for chasing the big speculative stuff that will be awesome when it happens, but you can't guarantee that it will. I love that advice. Laura, you are amazing. I want to ask you one final question. This is how we end all of our interviews on this podcast. Fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So, so make the most of your time. Um, I really do believe that time is precious and time is plentiful. And once an hour is gone, it is gone. Like all the money in the world cannot buy it back. Um, so from that perspective, we should try to choose well with our time. But I promise you that if you do make good, solid choices with your time, you can feel like you do have a ton of time. I mean, time spent on things you enjoy doing can feel rich and full and, and like it is abundant. Um, so knowing that we don't have an infinite amount of time 
can encourage us to make wise choices. But then when we do make wise choices, time feels good enough that, you know, you don't need infinite amounts of time. I absolutely love that. Laura, thank you so much for your advice today. Please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, your books, and your writing. Yeah, so please come visit my website, lauravandercam.com. That's just my name. Um, I blog about four times a week there, so there's always new content. You can also read about my books there. Um, The new one, Juliet's School of Possibilities, is just out. That's the time management fable, so hopefully people will check that out or check out my podcast as well. Wonderful. We'll link to all of that in our show notes. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks for having me. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcast on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen to. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group, where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives, for a good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glant.